Hello. Um, so, with this being, this will be the last part of the workshop build, um, I thought, well, I said that it would do a bit of a tour and also um, run over some cost. So, this is kind of what it looks like in its finished form on the external side. There are a little bits of, a few bits of touch up to do, um, and a few uh, step lights to install, but basically, this is the finished product. So, from the outside, I'll do a quick look around on the outside and then have a quick look on the inside and then we'll discuss some costs. So the idea is that it's a um, timber frame uh, metal clad uh, unit with insulation and built primarily, the frame is built primarily of 2x3 um, material with the odd bit of 2x4 and the foundations are 2x6s um, and the external cladding is uh, steel sheets from a cord steel and the roof is a custom length uh, roof and we've got some um, metal uh, cladding on the ends of it as well just coming a look you'll have seen in some of the previous videos at the very very start the foundation is based on um, uh, high density um, concrete blocks and on top of that we've got some damp proofing and we've got some um, the timber sit on top of that. The cladding on the outside is um, again from a cord steel and out of all of the parts of the build the metal work is, was actually probably the most challenging, most dangerous feeling and also the most expensive. Uh, but it made definitely the most significant amount of difference to the appearance of the hut once it was done. The other large expenses on this um, build as single units was that door which um, if you've had a look at any of the other videos we had a massive amount of trouble trying to get the door to be um, fitted this door on the left hand side um, it just doesn't fit at the bottom because the door is actually bent in three places down its um, vertical length uh, specifically, specifically on the handle side so you can get it to seal at the top but you can't get it to seal at the bottom I've talked to b and and I've talked to Crystal Direct and they've eventually, um, after a huge amount of trauma, um, uh, agreed to swapping that left hand door out, which was pretty good. So that arrives next week. Pardon the plane. Other than that, the other externals are we've got a bit of lighting going on there. We obviously got the decks. little deck on this side where the stable door comes in and again we've got some lighting. On the right hand side there you see that the little box there that's what holds the shop vac and this metal conduit is purely to um, bring services to that box so we've got a hose and uh, shop vac hose and shop vac power running out to that little box there. So let's have a look inside. So inside, um, as you notice, it's a lot quieter, but basically we have the curved ceiling of the hut, two main metal conduits that run across the full length of the hut, which bring lighting um, across the whole ceiling. We've got these lighting bars, uh, light strips that are running across in the shadow gap um, of the roof line. Um, these, the two sides of the, of the hut, that lighting provides an amazing amount of light uh, so at night time it's just like being in daylight basically um, beyond that we've got a central um, pillar or central beam which is non-supporting or it's not structural um, it's more for aesthetics and also to be able to mount stuff like that power strip off it that is not currently connected because this will be part of the part pay electrical work when it gets done the windows, the two windows are the same size as each other, so dimensionally it made it easier to plan for and figure out where they're going to go and how big they're going to be cutouts and such like. But horizontally, um, working from the workbench, this is kind of my eye view. I get to peep out the window and look up into the, the hillside. Hopefully when we get rid of that dead conifer in the middle there, it'll open it up a little bit and we should be able to put some uh, 
terracing into the hill at the back there and get some wildlife uh, watching points there. So potentially we'll have a camera feed watching what goes on out there as well. Um, the room is consisting of uh, the floor. It's basically you've got the foundation level, you've got the um, foundation beam substrate, then you've got an OSB layer on top of it. You've got a second layer of OSB. Sorry, that first layer of OSB is where the frame, the wall frame is built from. The second layer of OSB sits within the room and is isolated from the floor level. And then we've got a layer of um, these floorboards that you see on top of it as well. The floorboards were actually an additional to the plan. So they were an unexpected spend, but it became, well, I wanted to make the floor a little bit more solid. And I also wanted to be able to screw into the floor without having to worry about going through that bottom layer of OSB. So um, that's why we put the, the additional flooring down. And plus it looks a lot nicer. The walls are, the top half of them are, um, OSB, are, are um, plywood and the bottom of them are cladding. So it's just a sort of 12 mil cladding, uh, shiplap cladding and flat level for the top. The idea being that I wanted a good solid plywood siding to be able to hang lots and lots of stuff off. As you can see, I've already hung lots and lots of stuff off it. Um, and the cladding down the bottom, uh, if I wanted to get into it to be able to um, uh, run electric or run anything through the, the wall, it'd be a bit easier pulling the cladding off than it would be to pull a huge big chunk of um, ply off. The ply obviously hides all of the insulation and such like. Um, it's just directly behind the wall, so um, I don't need to worry about uh, running into anything when I'm screwing stuff into the wall. And this is another reason why we uh, surface mounted all of the electrics is so that there's nothing surprising hidden in the wall um, for future use. Um, when you know I get bored of doing workshopping stuff and turn this into a, a into an office or something, but basically everything surface mounted, make it as flexible as possible so we can change it as much as possible. Um, what else have we got going on? Uh, that's sort of the structural side of stuff. So for the actual making it a workshop kind of thing, there's been quite a lot of projects going on like this, making the workbench, uh, which we'll get into in perhaps in a little bit later on, making the scrap wood um, table for the drill uh, press, making all of the uh, conduiting and uh, 3D printing the parts for the dust extraction and all of the blast gates we've got going on. We've got French cleats in the two corners, the two opposite corners of the room, so that we've got all of the stuff that we'll pretty much need at any point in time uh, while working on the workbench. It's all stored on here. So we've got drill bits, router bits, um, more drill bits, all of the sort of frequent used things, the bench dog holes, um, saws, uh, you know, all of that sort of goodness. And the idea that I found is that I will build something based on its need at that point in time. So I'm not trying to predict my needs here. I'm just going, right, I need to do something about this. And that's why a lot of the projects I'm doing, I'm jumping around from subject to subject within it because I'm seeing a need, solving that need, and then going back to the main project. On the wall, on the electrics, so the main electric feed comes in from there into a fused spur. It's got an isolator on the outside. Um, it comes up to here and splits off uh, to the socket. The socket is the only thing that's currently live and everything else is running off that. I'm quite conscious that that's a lot of stuff running off that, which is why I generally only run two things at once uh, of any particular load. The things that are permanently on are uh, the Wi-Fi and the Alexa point. The other things that we've got going on here is that this is all chargers and lighting. And the lighting there is just a, a low level or a low voltage uh, 24 volt system, which runs all of the lighting from it. And there doesn't seem to be any problems with that. Originally, I was going to have that have a um, dimmer switch on it, but it being in such close proximity to the uh, Wi-Fi access point, it basically kicked the access, access point offline when you turn the lighting on. So that is not in the uh, equation anymore. And I don't think I'll bring it back because with the smart switch attached to it, you can just turn off the uh, off the hood lighting or you can turn it on. 
and likewise we've got a smart switch attached there to the shop vac so this is really useful so from anywhere in the in the shop i can just shout for um the smart home to start the shop vac and it starts it up and i don't have to worry about it so i don't have to reach back across the room when i'm just ready to make a cut and i've forgotten to start the shop vac up on the far side we've got all the bin storage, PPE, um, fire extinguisher, uh, first aid kit, cleaning towels, and little coat rack. Um, in my uh, scraps bin, which I desperately need to do something about. A uh, little timber uh, trolley that I had from the last location for all of this stuff. So this is all sort of bigger flat goods. Uh, the timber storage. Um, most of this wood here is either leftover from the build uh, or it's um, a bunch of scrap wood that one of our neighbours was getting rid of and there's some really quite good wood in there so really really pleased about getting all that it gives us lots and lots of material to work in future projects from and the actual build of putting the um, the timber uh, rack on the walls following a Jay Bates video um, it was his video and lots of other people have done it but his video is the one that gave us the confidence that it would hold the weight of all of the stuff so um i'll pop a link in there somewhere i guess um but yeah that worked really really well it took all of the material that was outside and um let me store it all in one single place it has impacted the light a little bit but it's not a substantial amount of impact and certainly when i've been working on the little mitre uh, station here i've not really noticed it for storage, a lot of the tooling and a lot of the um, bigger, bulkier stuff sits in here. Uh, I'll probably revise this in the future when um, I get a little bit more organized on the storage. But as I was saying before, I don't need to do anything about it right now. So I'm not going to do anything about it until I find I do need have the need. All of the small parts and materials, they're all in these standard units. Um, and I've spent quite considerable time sorting all of those out. So it's really, really... Uh, easy to find they're all grouped together in um, methods there are obviously some smaller bins that are on the top there which uh, could do with being sorted out but i will sort those out in the future again i don't need to do anything about it right now so i'm going to leave it and then the last bit there is uh, another french cleat clamp wall um, and that's pretty much it for the tour um we've got uh, the uh, fire um detector up there as well smoke detector up there as well um what else have we got going on in here anything at all the dust extraction i've seen a bit but it all runs out from this pipe along the back here you see the gray and the orange blast gates that are going on there um and this all feeds in from from this pipe here which is the one that goes out to the shop vac all feeds down and comes into a cyclone and comes into a hard uh, metal bin that we, that's easy to get into and it'll be down here that I will um, tighten up, tidy up that cable and also this is probably where I'll store my um, bench top jigs uh, just as a sort of sort, uh, slot mechanism underneath the workbench um, we've just got some more bin storage and uh, glues and larger things that don't fit anywhere else and again a couple more of the Stanley um, organizers for all of our external uh, screws and materials. So with that in mind, uh, let's talk about materials and costs. So, costs, obviously uh, with COVID, the costs uh, exploded. So the original concept of the hut was that the cost was going to be um, we were looking at a kit, uh, or we were looking at a full a full unit. Um, a full unit was looking at between sixteen and twenty four thousand or twenty six thousand, depending on how finished the product was. So a uh, full hut was between uh, sixteen and twenty four k. The problem that we had with a full hut solution is that a it was massively expensive. B, we wouldn't be able to get it on site because you can't get a trailer that would carry something this size down our drive. Um, it's too steep and the corner's too tight to be able to get something down here. 
And if you could get it down here, you wouldn't be able to get the vehicle back out based, based on uh, how big they are. So a full hood um, as a bought unit meant that we would either need to compromise the size of the hood or um, compromise where we're going to put it or uh, basically decide to try and build it in kit format. So that was the next thing we looked at is the kits. And a kit format was between, I think it was around about 8,000, 8,500 to 11,000. Um, depending on how finished, again, how much stuff you got, which which ones you went for. Um, this looked really quite attractive, but the companies that we talked to um, were really, really helpful. However, the time scales, this is when the pandemic was really kicking off and the time scales were going through the roof. So if we wanted it any time uh, soon, we just wouldn't have been able to get it. We still wouldn't have it now if we'd ordered it back in April when uh, when we were first looking, first or when we first started the work. So this, again, we had shipping problems, um, getting it to site and having to manhandle all the, the uh, stuff down to where it needs to be, that sort of thing. So it still became a bit of a trauma to try and figure out logistically how we do that. And plus it was still 11,000 or um, it was going up to 16,000 on some of them. So we started looking at um, even more basic kits like just the frame itself and um, just component parts that could be shipped in as individual units uh, and then constructed on site. And we did find a company, Harrogate Huts, who they were really, really good. They were really friendly, really fast to respond. Uh, but unfortunately, it was their timescales that was the real killer. Um, otherwise, we would have been able to, or we would have probably just bought one of those. And certainly if we built another one, if it was within a time scale that we wanted it quickly, like if we wanted it in a couple of months, then I'll probably just buy a, a kit from them and get it constructed or get it delivered flat pack and then construct it on site. So it's still a strong option, but we investigated how much would it cost in time and money to just do it ourselves. And this is kind of, this 8,000 was kind of where we topped out our self build. And we reckoned, uh, I reckoned it was basically between the very, very lowest it would be, it would be about six and a half thousand. And the highest I reckoned was around about eight and a half thousand. Depending on the designs and such like. So eight and a half thousand was for the workshop to be uh, six meters long. And in reality, what we ended up doing is we changed the design to reduce the costs, reduce the overall footprint, and it's now 4.8 meters long. So those were the kind of monies that we were looking at. Um, and uh, we eventually obviously went for the self-built because we really quite fancied building it ourselves. It gave us ultimate freedom on what the design was gonna be, it gave us ultimate freedom on changing our plans midway and um, and basically tailoring it and making it really bespoke to exactly what we wanted. So with that in mind, uh, we started on the self-build um, journey. I'll just grab a bit of content, uh, which is the, um, I, to track the project, uh, what I did was I basically built a sheet for tracking all of the costs, making sure all the costs were a similar sort of, um, or were under control and were predictable. And so this all went into a spreadsheet on, uh, on Google. And you can't really see this, but basically every single line uh, is a product or a group of products. And there's 156 lines, individual lines of product that I've tracked and purchased from various different suppliers. I've given them install statuses and completed statuses and, and required as I bought and used them. Um, we've got uh, cost breakdowns of total cost of the line, the total predicted cost of the unit, how much we've actually spent so far. Um, and I also broke it down into when the stages that were happening or when it was being purchased. So the stages the build I broke down into multiple different sections. We've got foundation, the base frame, the main frame for the room, the roof, the outer envelope, so that's all of the external cladding and skin, the inner envelope, so that's all the internal cladding and skin, the electrics, 
the finishing parts, which is all the trim work and all that sort of stuff, and the tools that were required for the pit, for the job. I broke the tools down into even further um, uh, levels where I'm basically saying that tools that are dedicated to the task, so things that I don't really anticipate using again, and tools that I will definitely use again, um, just so that I tr could track how much it actually costs to build the hut rather than how much it would cost to just get excited and buy other toys. So the total costs, um, the, those those different stages actually. Foundation, I expected to buy a, a, a wood delivery for the foundation and the base frame section. I expected to buy a wood a delivery for the main frame and supporting the roof. And I expected to buy a delivery of wood for the outer envelope, the envelope, inner envelope and the finishing. So that was three timber deliveries that I was expecting. And in reality, because I changed the plans slightly and got the, the um the floorboards uh, put down, we got four deliveries of timber. And the first delivery of timber, if we look at it, um, which was the uh, shipment from Prodo Timber, it cost us almost 300. Uh, the expectation was, was each of those um, individual timber shipments that I just talked about would cost between 300 and 400 pounds each. So that would have given us like 1,200 as a cost on the timber cost. So this is the original predicted timber cost. So it was about 400 per drop. So that's 1,200 in total is what we kind of expected this pay on the timber. Um, bear in mind that what actually happened is that we had four drops of it so you'd kind of expect that if we were working on the original pricing to be around about 1600 in timber costs so the main challenge around that was that obviously covid happened and the price of timber went through the absolute roof and on this particular graph here um this line here is the timber cost let's see if i can get it a bit bigger I might be able to I might be able to see it. So this is the all of the hardware, timber, sheet timber, um tape and wraps, solids. So the, I broke down all of the things I was buying to different individual items as well, or I, uh, groups, so that I could track how much certain things cost. And timber, uh you can see is just by far the highest. So that's two and a half thousand, two thousand six hundred or or thereabouts plus the sheet timber, which is about 300, uh, 250. So looking at the costs of the timber in total, um, it's almost 3,000, which is like over 3,000. In fact, yeah, it is over 3,000. So actual real costs was 3,000 plus. Um, if you look at the actual completed costings of the build, the total predicted, bear in mind this is all of the stuff that we've bought um, and installed for it, the total predicted spend for this product was £8,636.04. That's how much we expected to spend on it. And this was just a tracking total. So as we added more things into it, the cost went up. We actually didn't spend quite that much. It went down by basically about 50 quid. Um, and that's because we planned on buying a, a reel of cable or something like this, and we just didn't buy it. So that is basically how much the hut cost to build um, in purely in materials, the deliveries, all that sort of stuff. It's not my time to actually build it. But if you consider that the original cost of this was 1,600, so it was gonna roll in at around about 7,000 um, if timber costs had stayed as they were. But the first, once the first shipment was um, purchased for, for the foundation work, the follow-up shipment found that the supplier that I was using had basically just run out of timber um, and the, I had to shift to a more expensive, more, um, a more finished timber level uh, product. 
uh, the supplies were still really good, but the price had basically tripled. So each of the following um, drops of timber cost between 800 and 1,000. Um, so that must actually be close to 3,600. Um, and this obviously knocked the price up quite considerably. And that's basically the difference between what we, where we expected it to be and where it landed is the timber costs. Uh, the other things that were surprising that went up in costs were screws. So at the start of it, um, I, I was quite happily buying packs of screws for uh, um, the, the sort of the 100 mil um, screws, and they were about three pounds. And at the end of it, the three pound ones were not available anymore, and you had to buy the eight pound ones instead. So there was increases in other areas where you'd buy something one week for X amount, and then the next week it'd have gone up by a quarter. And there was some stuff that was 30 pounds, and then the next week when we had to go back and buy another one, it was 45 pounds. So there were other um, COVID inflation costs and Brexit costs basically, and that uh, impacted the bill quite significantly. But that was basically how much it cost. In total time to build a workshop, I've worked it out, is it took uh, around about 34 man days. So 34 times seven and a half hours. That was based on the calculations, working on the video output and the the the, the photographic evidence and the timestamps against them, to try and calculate roughly how much it was. So that's thirty four working days for a total build for one man. So if you had two people working on this project. You could probably get it done in two weeks quite easily. If you get three people on a project, you'd probably get it done in a week. But you're starting to hit um, finite returns at this point because you're not going to be able to get uh, uh, have enough time in the schedule to let things dry for painting and such like. So that's you can work out the, the, the cost yourself on the minimum wage as to how much that costs and whether or not it's worth um, or it would have cost. Uh, whereabouts in this scale it would have cost and um, if we put in the, the cost of the man manor uh, on top of the, the actual asset costs but this is kind of where I wanted to end it was this is how much it really cost this is how much it was um, that's how long it took if I would built it again I suspect you could probably shave quite a considerable amount of time off that based on what I know now what I didn't know I needed um, at the start I mean the idea of the timber itself if i'd managed to build or get all of the timber all at once at the very start it would have massively saved on costs and it would have massively reduced the actual delivery time so this 34 working days is over the period of three or three and a half months yeah four months yeah because the the original idea was that i wanted to get it done for august and the end we got it done at the end of august and it was ready to go um, in September so it was about a month over schedule but each of these delivery deliveries of the um, timber they had like a week or 10 day lead time on the delivery the steel work that took six weeks or five weeks to deliver the door took eight weeks to deliver um, some of the other stuff uh, the windows were delayed by a few days but because we had to break up the deliveries into multiple parts each one of those occurred, one of these delays, which meant that the timeline was just stretched out. In reality, this wasn't too bad for me because I'm obviously working at the same time. It meant that I could put a lot of effort into a weekend of work or an evening of work and then wait for the rest of the stuff and recover from the, the excesses of, um, of putting everything together. So it didn't really matter that much, but it just added time on. Things I'd have probably done differently if I was going to do it again. Um, Make sure that the foundation was square. Make sure you get really, really good timber for your foundation and um, that is not twisted, warped or anything like that. See if you can get someone who, uh, see if you can get a second person on hand to do a lot of the, the heavy lift. And the other thing that I think, there was a bit of uh, wariness because everything was coming directly out of our pocket um, for spending the on the materials. There was a wariness to use some of the materials inappropriately. Um, but I wish I had built the scaffolding at the start of the construction as soon as I had that timber in place. 
that would have made such a huge difference to actually putting things together. Um, it would have made it a lot safer um, and it would have made it a lot faster. There was a lot of procrastination around how am I going to do this particular thing? Whereas if I just bit the bullet, used that material um, and uh, built the scaffold at the start, that would have made things so much easier. So don't be too heavily tied or I wouldn't, uh, the next time around, I would try not to be too heavily or emotionally attached to the material being uh, good and just use what I need to use for the job. Um, but yes, I think other than that, super, super pleased with how it's worked out. Um, it's maintaining a fairly decent temperature in here. The power is the main next task that needs an external person to come and fix, but this probably needs house electrics to be addressed as well. For inside of the hut, it's about tooling projects, um, making the, the uh, hut more efficient in, in how it can do it, improving the ground-based egg dust extraction and starting to really get into some projects. So just a bit of information about the individual build uh, stage costs. Uh, so if you remember, I broke it up into foundation, base frame, main frame, roof, outer skin, inner skin and finishing. That's pretty much the order it was built in. And then I've got a specific spend line for dedicated tools for that will only be used for the project and general reusable tools. So if you look at the foundation costs, a uh, round about uh, about 200 180 something like that the base frame costs are just under 500 so we'll just call it 500 the main frame costs which is the timber in the uh, the main frame plus the um, I think if I remember rightly, it was some of the uh, the second layer of OSB, um, unless that was the skin. Anyway, main frame, that is looking at 1,300. So that, the main frame is the wall framing, the roof framing. Um, it's not the skin attached to it. That's all part of the inner and the outer skinning of the roof. So the roof itself, this is the roof metal work. Um, that is 1,200 or thereabouts. This is also including things like sealants for that. The, um, the foam uh, rods and screws for that particular purpose, all of that sort of stuff. Um, this is one thing that was quite surprising is how much hardware actually went into the build. You know, uh, uh, at the very, very start, I was naively thinking that, you know, a thousand screws would probably do it. And in reality, uh, I've gone through over three and a half thousand, almost four thousand decking screws and um, just plugging various different bits and bobs together. There's also um, at least uh, 600 screws just, um, uh, not sorry, uh, 200 screws in the floor here. Um, but in general woodworking screws, um, well over 2,000 screws in the build as well. So screws and hardware, even though they don't cost much, they certainly add up. Um, I would expect the, the screw total to be around about 9,000 or uh, it's the hardware total to be around about 9,000 individual objects um, in this part of the build. Anyway, out of skin, this is the uh, cladding for the outside it's the osb that's underneath that it's the house wrap it's the tape it's the um metal work the windows the window frame that sort of stuff and this was really high so 2800 the single most expensive things were the was the metal work um the reason why we chose metal rather than timbering it all was I wanted a little bit more of a reliable siding. And yes, it looks super cool as well, but I wanted to be able to get this thing up as fast as possible and not have to deal with it straight afterwards. And that's what I did, is it allowed us to just 
get the building watertight really, really fast. The costs of uh, delivering the stuff was really expensive. It was almost 300 um, for the delivery uh, of the of the metalwork. So while the, the metalwork itself was expensive, it was just over 1,200, um, you know, 300 of that was delivery. So it was really, really quite, quite extravagant. If it got it with, if it didn't go for a cool blue color, and if I decided to go with just standard sheet um, galves uh, steel looking, uh, yeah, it'd look a bit more like an industrial building at that particular point. But I could have got that locally and bypassed the um, delivery costs. But we what there was an aesthetic that we were after, and it looks really, really good. Really pleased that I've done it. Just took some time to get it and cost a lot more than expected. So. Inner skin, that's the internal OSB, the internal cladding, um, and the floorboards, and the roofing um, panel. Uh, that is 1,700 thereabouts. And then the finishing section. Oh, sorry then that's about 700. Finishing is all of the finished timber work. Uh, the electrics go into here as well. Um, it's uh, all of the stuff that makes it feel like it's a finished product basically. And the tooling costs. So we broke it down into dedicated tools and general use tools. The dedicated tools, uh, the things that we effectively spent and probably won't be used again is almost 300 so this is things like uh the um conduit die cutter which i don't really intend to use the the conduit um in another major project inside the house so it was seen as a dedicated tool um what was another dedicated tool um i'm trying to think of so I suppose I could just look at this uh, here document. Uh, so if I look for dedicated tools, so things like a panel carrier um, for carrying the sheet material down the hill. Um, dedicated tools, the die cutter is in dedicated tools. Huh. So if I if this page, which is the complete spend, is uh, to be believed rather than the funky pivot table, um, the dedicated tools are much, much, much cheaper than uh, stated. So there's obviously something wrong with the spreadsheet at that particular point. Um, if we assume that the dedicated tools are uh, is just a, a general anomaly, the general use tools is around about two hundred, uh, about four hundred quid. So I'm guessing that what actually the case is is that the dedicated tools is uh, or general use tools inco incorporate the dedicated tools as well. And it's just a calculation error on the on the spreadsheet. And so yeah, about um, four fifty. But this did also include things uh, like the track saw and um, the guide plane, the uh, drill press. All that kind of stuff, all of the just random different little toolings and things that needed to be bought. Let's see if we can find some general use tools. So tape rollers, that sort of stuff. Um, but general use tools. Uh, so we've got uh, countersink bits. We've got vapor filters, uh, angle grinder spanners, the the door and um, cushions, that sort of stuff. They're all. They can be reused somewhere else, so they're not really, uh, they're not specific to this particular build. Um, standing knife filing kit, that sort of thing. So this is kind of the costs. If you look at the costs of the total cost there, sort of 680 or 630 of it, roll that up. Um, that's how much it cost. If you already had some of these things, then the costs of the total build would be down. Uh, because you don't need to go and buy the tools for it. So some of the, the costs, um, like 10% of the costs are equipment 
uh, equipping cost. Uh, what else have we got going on in here? Um, the other things that I thought might be quite interesting. Uh, I've mentioned the number of screws and hardware. Um, one of the things that was quite good is I deliberately bought only what I needed. So I very rarely bought over. And I have this green line that you can probably see. That's the installed line. So it shows that out of all of it, um, or actually that should be completely installed as well. So all of the stuff that we bought uh, is pretty much been used some place or, or another. And it might be uh, some of it isn't 100% uh, used. And we used like five out of six or five out of seven. But the level of waste that we've got coming out of the out of the build at the end of it is really, really small. Uh, I was really pleased with how close I managed to calculate the quantities. Bear in mind, it's the first time I've quite, uh, calculated quantities on such a uh, level. Uh, there was a couple of places where I completely underestimated the requirements, though. Things like the tape, uh, the house wrap tape, is... I thought 50 meters would be enough, yet in reality you used 150 meters. So the screws, I thought around about 1,500 screws or something like that would be enough, yet I used like four or 5,000 screws. Um, there's other things that uh, I did have already that um, I haven't, that were not um, purchased on specifically in build, but there were very small amounts of things and everything was pretty much um, purchased specifically for the product. Staples, loads of staples, absolutely loads of staples. So we've got a thousand fourteen mil staples, a thousand ten mil staples, and then further down we've got another set of staples as well, another couple of sets of staples. So I think in total it was about three and a half thousand staples in the build at the same time. Um, so it's surprising if it was. If you're going to uh, provide any recommendations for people is make sure you've got a sta uh, staple supply a, a reliable supply of those types of materials so i think i will stop it there thank you very much and if you've got any questions then you know give us a shout bye